great speakers today, um, two from NIST, Craig Watson, Naomi Lefkowitz, and then we have one from the Census Bureau, Daniel Lewis. Um, to start, I'd like to bring Craig Watson up. Um, Craig Watson is currently the image group leader at the National Institute of Standards and Technology and has been at NIST for 25 years. During his time with NIST, he has been engaged in numerous initiatives to improve biometric technologies. He has expertise with biometric technology evaluations, including the fingerprint vendor technology evaluation, proprietary fingerprint testing, minutia interoperability exchange test, and SLAP fingerprint segmentation evaluation. He has been part of teams that have received a Department of Commerce Gold Medal Award in 2003 and the Department of Commerce Silver Medal Award in 2004 for their work related to biometric technologies. Craig? Thank you, Kevin. Um, all right, first, I want to say thank you to everyone who uh, took the, were able to get out early and brave the traffic to get here for the 8 a.m. session. Um, I, I appreciate you being here and, uh, and just appreciate you being here. So I, I am Craig Watson, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the work in our, the image group related to biometrics. I'm going to first highlight um, a, a little bit of the approach we take to biometrics, and then I'm going to walk you through some of the various projects we have going on. And um, in the interest of time, if we, if we get a little behind and there's not time for questions, I will hang out in the hall afterwards, so you can definitely catch me for questions afterwards. So today, in terms of biometrics at NIST, we are working in areas of fingerprint, uh, uh, fingerprint face, iris, tattoo, speaker recognition, and DNA. Uh, the image group's primary focus is uh, to develop and contribute to stand biometric standards. Um, and our approach is highlighted in this diagram with, with the four primary elements in color, uh, the boxes in color. So if you focus on that um, at a high level in order to promote standards, first we look for gaps and focus areas of need in, in, in biometrics. We do this by interacting with industry, academia, and government sponsors to determine where these needs are and where NIST can provide contribution. So NIST is currently partnering with the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and IARPA in various ways to work on areas of such as contactless and unattended fingerprint capture, um, iris recognition, unconstrained face and text matching, speaker recognition, and data transmission and image quality standards. Uh, we then take these focus areas and we typically look for ways to evaluate technology and make measurement of performance. These technology evaluations usually involve um, large sample biometric data sets. Um, the image group has built a biometrics research lab at NIST and we house um, several million biometric samples for this testing of uh, uh, various modalities. The data is sequestered data that is not publicly available, and, and it provides a unique opportunity for industry, academia, to evaluate software and technologies on a common set of very large uh, number of subjects of data. And we're always looking to update that data and, and make it keep it relevant to operational uh, settings. The resulting knowledge from these technology evaluations then feed into technical contributions uh, to the biometrics community. One way is by offering a snapshot of current technology capabilities, and in the case of newer technologies, it might show how mature the technology is and does it, work, or does it need work to uh, improve and get significantly better. In most cases, there are also some sort of failure analysis that we do and, and provide feedback to the, the participants of these evaluations that might help improve the technology. Um, this analysis also helps to feed back into the standards and address areas of issues um, for the end users of the technology. Now, wrapped up in all of this, uh, from a forensic standpoint, is the need for measurement of um, accuracy, um, uniqueness, permanence, and sufficiency. So, um, from a, uh, we want to measure the core capabilities, the accuracy of the core capabilities of the matching technology and test interoperability of the templates and data being used. From a uniqueness, uh, uniqueness from an evidential standpoint of view, um, for example, we want to look at measuring the probability that observing that two fingerprints either came from the same subject or, or from different fingers, um, and, and, and being able to measure that and quantify it. 
and sufficiency of the evidence. How much is enough? Um, we, we look at covariate analysis, uh, quality and preparation of the evidence, and, and some of these factors that impact recognition and, and potential bias. And finally is permanence, um, stability of the technology or the biometric over time, uh, the, the aging effect. So moving into work, so NIST standards, we'll start out with standards. Um, we, con we contribute to in the development and improvement of standards in the area of data formats, quality, performance measurement, um, and conformance testing. Uh, additionally, NIST publishes best practices recommendations for data collection. Um, we also do special publications such as 876-2, uh, the, the, the PIB certification. Um, it, NIST also participates in uh, technical working groups and standards groups such as Insights, M1, OASIS. Uh, we also are chair, of, we have the chair of SC37, and, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the ANSI NIST uh, ITL data transmission standard, which is the current version is update 2015. Um, recently, the one thing I want to announce is one, recently we, um, Diane Stevens, moved over from DHS to NIST, and she's now heading up that effort for us, so she's a, she's a primary contact in that, that area. Um, another area of standards is fingerprint image quality. So an important contribution to improving fingerprint quality capture uh, is NFIQ, um, which was recently updated to NFIQ2, um, and it see, saw improvements of uh, more levels of quality, uh, twice as fast, and then now, instead of being a de facto standard, it is actually part of an ISO standard. Um, and I will point out that it's, it's not just, NFIQ is not just about the image quality itself, visual, it's, it's a predictive measure of minutia-based matching. And there's some data showing how well it works, but also more importantly, it is available on our, for download on our website or, or the NIST GitHub site. Now, I was told beforehand I may have a few links here. Uh, NIST recently switched its web services over to a, a different uh, format. I, I think it was Drupal. But if there's any of these links that don't work, you can feel free to email me, and I'll make sure I connect you up with the right place to, to access things. I mentioned in my introduction slide about the connection to forensics and the need to measure accuracy, uniqueness, sufficiency, and permanence. Uh, NIST does have a forensic science program now, and, and one area of focus is uh, friction ridge analysis. And this work looks to answer questions like what to measure, how to measure, and how to produce um, quantitative support to decision making for, for legal reasons. Um, I do know there's a, I don't know the time, but there's a detailed talk on this in a session this afternoon. It might be late this morning or early afternoon. So, so feel free to stop by. Elham Tavasi will be talking in that session about this. Now we do uh, a lot of biometric evaluations and we've had, um, we've been experiencing this for about a decade and a half. Most recently, we, these evaluations have centered on fingerprint capture, human face examiners, unconstrained face recognition, multispectral iris recognition, tattoo recognition, and speaker recognition. Um, and I will touch on a few of these, uh, highlight a few of these. I will also say that there's, um, some of these I talk about will be in the IARPA session this afternoon. So I'm gonna give high level overviews, but you're, you're welcome to go to those other sessions and get detailed. Uh, information on those. We do, I want to point out, we do have an evaluation process that we've, we've formalized. Um, it looks at things, uh, you know, doing a challenge problem where we send out data to participants and they send results back. And this is more for emerging type technologies. Um, and then once it's a little more formalized, we do a sequestered evaluation where uh, the software comes to NIST and we do all the testing on NIST-owned hardware. Um, a key to this is data, and I mentioned before we have a large uh, repository of uh, sequestered data, and we are always looking to grow that, and, and very thankful to our other agency sponsors who have been able to share data with us, and we have a good human subjects office at NIST now that, that allows that to happen rather smoothly. We have developed an API, uh, a testing API, and we keep it generalized to be able to use across different biometrics. And that uh, API is developed with community feedback, so we've been able to uh, 
get feedback from participants and be able to, to format that API in a way that, that seems to work with operational settings. We tend to do phase testing. Um, there's, there's two types. We, we can do, a, like every couple years we do testing and, and a participant can send in their software, do testing, get results back, and then make tweaks, and we might do two or three phases of an evaluation. More recently, we've been looking at going, doing ongoing, and it seems to be a little more popular so that uh, participants can come in when, when it works best for them and, and participate in the, the evaluation, get results back, and then, and then maybe four or five months later participate again. Um, just touching on, we have, I was talking about the API, we've also developed a framework in, that works in our BRL, generalized in our BL, BRL to drive the hardware, and I just, uh, it works very well at parallelizing the, the submission and, and getting the most throughput we can on the hardware and getting a quick turnaround on these evaluations. We do share that um, uh, out on our, I, I believe on our GitHub site as well, so that is available. So switching to some of the evaluations that we do, um, we are involved with the, the Nail to Nail project with IARPA. They're, they're the primary sponsor. It's, so it's unassisted nail to nail capture, fingerprint capture. Uh, NIST role will be doing image and data analysis for the results of that. And what we're also looking to do is take some of that data that's been collected and try to make it publicly available. Um, and I use the word publicly available loosely because um, it's not gonna just be out for general download, but there'll be a, uh, a release agreement that has to be signed with it, um, which is kind of a, a new future of data release at NIST. Um, and that challenge is actually next week. So uh, that'll, that'll be happening, I think, out at the John Hobson's facility. And there is a, uh, I invite you, in the IR procession, I'm sure they'll go over more details of this, but there's a, a federal government day on Wednesday afternoon of next week. Um, I think you have to sign up for that ahead of time, but, but that's there. Um, so switching from fingerprint to face, we have the um, facial forensic examiner study uh, that's looking at human performance and face recognition. Uh, this study has, uh, is looking at the performance of three different groups, comparing that to the performance of four different algorithms from circa 2015 to 2017. The human examiners were from uh, face specialists and there were three different subgroups of expertise in that area. Uh, fingerprint examiners that didn't have face recognition experience and then untrained students. Uh, the study started in 2016 and, and there was actually world, really worldwide participation in it. Uh, we had consented uh, people from five different continents, at least five different continents. Um, and, NIST had participated in this, or partnered with uh, several universities in completing this study. And I know that there are um, some papers that are in review that will be published soon on, on results from that study. And if you know Jonathan Phillips, he's, he's the contact point for that. Um, continuing with uh, face recognition, we had recently completed the, the five study, which is face and video evaluation. This was a large-scale study of face recognition from non-cooperative subjects from six different video data sets. And as you can see, there were 16 algorithms uh, from develop, I'm sorry, algorithms from 16 developers, 36 different algorithms total. Um, and then we used various face metrics to assess performance of those algorithms. And, and that report is currently available on the NIST website. We also recently have started, and this is going into the ongoing realm, uh, FRVT um, is, is now an ongoing evaluation, and it's currently one-to-one, -one, so it's open for participation at any time. Um, and we've already tested 44 algorithms from 27 developers. And metrics are very similar across to, to other ones that are reported on accuracy, speed, template size, and, and it, we're also looking at additional demographic information, looking at bias in, in algorithms. And the, the key here, too, is we're also looking this coming year to, uh, to put out a one-to-many track for FRVT. So there'll be an ongoing one-to-many track in the, next, in the next year. So the final face 
Um, evaluation is, um, is one that we're partnering with IARPA. Um, it, it's face, and it's a face recognition prize challenge. And, and again, this will be highlighted in more detail in the IARPA session. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time here, but there are, as you can see, there's various tracks and cash prizes available. And, and the challenge also used um, numerous unconstrained face data sets. Um, there also is an IRIS, we have IRIS 9, and that is currently running in its final phase. Um, we have submissions from 13 participants, and it's looking at multispectral results in IRIS recognition. Um, and it's a large scale evaluation with both one to one and one to many. Um, that report should be coming out in 2018. Hopefully, it says mid 2018, hopefully a little sooner than that, but, but in, in 2018. And from IRIS, we move, we have TATU. So TAT-E is our TATU recognition evaluation, and it carries over from the TAT-C challenge that was run in 2015. Um, it currently, I think it's still, yes, it's still accepting submissions till the end of September. It's in its final phase, um, and it's looking at use cases of TATU identification, TATU detection and localization, and, and matching sketches of TATUs to, to real TATUs. It uses a large set of sequestered operational data that we've received from um, other agencies and, and law enforcement. And, um, and that report, after the phase three completes, will come out in, in early 2018. And finally, I'll, I'll point out, um, it's not in my group, but we do have at NIST, we do speaker recognition as well. Um, so there, there's just a plot of showing some performance over time, but I just wanted to get out there that there's also speaker recognition work being done at NIST, and, um, and if you contact me, I can put you in connection with the right people for that. So that's the update I have on what work's being done at NIST and biometrics. Um, I will definitely hang out if you have questions, specific questions about the evaluations or timings, uh, things like that afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, next up, we have Naomi Lefkowitz, Lefkowitz sorry, from NIST. Um, she served as the Senior Privacy Policy Advisor at NIST since March 2012, specializing in the impact on privacy from digital identity management, cybersecurity, and other information technologies. Naomi previously served as Director for Privacy and Civil Liberties, Cybersecurity Directorate in the White House and Senior Attorney, Division of Privacy and Identity Protection in the Federal Trade Commission, where her specialty areas included online privacy, digital identity management, data security, and consumer financial protection laws. Naomi? Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to just give you a quick overview of the uh, NIST Privacy Engineering Program, which is a relatively new program uh, that we've been developing. And uh, so, and I, I also will take any questions outside if, if you have any. So every program needs a mission statement, of course, um, but I will. I will not bore you with reading this. I just want to draw your attention to a couple of key points. So, um, so the privacy engineering program is sort of organizationally located in the applied cybersecurity division in the information technology lab. And so, um, so one of the things that we're really interested in is trustworthy systems. And I think typically trustworthiness has been associated with security. Um, but what we are saying is that there are a number of sort of quality attributes of trustworthiness and privacy needs to be one of them. Uh, and, and, and the other main point that I want to bring your attention to is that, you know, privacy is often talked about, I guess, in very maybe philosophic terms or, you know, it's very subjective, it's not really amenable to analysis. and. Um, what we are saying is that, you know, we believe that we can apply, um, you know, measurement science and systems engineering principles uh, to this field uh, to help us develop better guidance um, and 
tools for uh, engineering privacy into systems. Uh, so this is our foundational document um, that we finalized this uh, early this year in January. Uh, and in this uh, NIST internal report, we introduced concepts of privacy engineering and privacy risk management. Um, and one of the challenges is that we um, realized that we were talking to two somewhat different audiences. Uh, one is the kind of the security audience and one is the privacy audience, which is mostly made up of policy or legal people. And so they didn't exactly talk the same language. And so when you talk to security people, they think, oh, privacy, that's protecting, you know, personal data, done. Um, and when you talk to privacy people, so like, they're often like, risk management, like, no, 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 you know, I, I don't know what that is. So, um, so we realized we really had to both explain um, the relationship of privacy to security as well as the broader scope um, that is more than just data security uh, and also begin to bring privacy people into the world of, you know, systems engineering and, and risk management. Um, uh, and, and that we really didn't have a great uh, lexicon for talking about that relationship. So that was one thing that we tried to do with this document. Um, uh, the second thing is, you know, as if we are going to bring sort of measurement science and systems engineering principles, um, we really have to begin to understand what we're trying to analyze. And, and so that was another major part of this document was to develop a frame of analysis for privacy so that we could introduce a privacy risk model um, that really captured the, uh, you know, the distinctions from security, recognizing that there's an overlap around security of PII, of personally identifiable information, but also recognizing that you know, when systems are processing uh, personal data in order to, you know, achieve some kind of function, um, even though that is intentional processing, it can create uh, privacy risks for individuals. Um, and by that, um, you know, and, and so we really, as I said, didn't want to sort of go down the long and many years debate about what privacy means. We really wanted a, a simple frame of analysis that systems engineers could use. and. And so we said at the heart of it, when systems are processing information, they can create sort of privacy related problems for individuals that could be um, you know, related to uh, loss of trust or economic harm or you know, stigmatization or embarrassment, you know, a very wide scope of problems, but nonetheless, they're actually cognizable. And so we can actually analyze systems to see if they you know, what's the likelihood and the impact of their creating these types of problems for individuals. Um, and so that was the other main point of this, this document was to bring out a, introduce a set of privacy engineering objectives um, and a, a privacy risk model so that we could then um, go on to the next stage of our work. Uh, so as part of that next stage, uh, we actually developed a tool, um, a privacy risk assessment methodology for um, implementing the privacy risk model. Um, and so we've actually, this is um, at the moment a somewhat manual um, set of worksheets, but it is actually a literal tool. Um, and we've used it now uh, with, or I should say, at least uh, over 30 organizations have, have used this, both in our um, Trusted Identities Group pilot space, um, as well as inside the government, even inside of NIST. We eat our own dog food, of course. Um, and it's really, um, found, we found that it really helps us to analyze, you know, the, the processing, the data flows, and understand how that could um, impact individuals so that we can then ultimately select controls. Um, that can help to actually, and we can actually then understand, are these controls going to be effective to uh, mitigate these identified risks? So we are um, 
actively um, using this pram, um, some upcoming uh, places. We are working in the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Um, they're working with Department of Transportation to do a project um, on automated um, vehicles. And so many, many projects upcoming that we will be using this to really try to analyze privacy risk and see what kinds of controls we can put in. Uh, so as I said, we really view privacy as a quality attribute. So, uh, you know, when you are a system has a particular function um, and it can do it with more or less privacy protections. Uh, and so, so our goal is to really collaborate, um, not just at NIST, but outside as well, on the kinds of uh, functional projects that are happening and really see how we can integrate privacy. So um, this is just some of it. We also work in the standards space in ISO and IEEE um, on standards, especially ones related to privacy engineering or, um, or security integration. Uh, and you might notice that you know, there's quite a few on uh, trusted identities and certainly there is a very natural connection between identity management and uh, the need for privacy. And I'll just take a moment to plug our uh, 11 o'clock um, presentation on a practical application for privacy and civil liberties where we'll be talking a lot more about privacy and identity. Um, finally, um, I just want to say a quick word about some of the guidance, our roadmap that we are working on. So we've heard again and again that there's a great interest in integrating privacy into um, the security uh, risk management uh, documents that we already have. So, you know, typically privacy has been treated as, you know, the appendix at the end, um, something separate. Uh, which security people say, oh, I don't need to worry about that, or I don't even understand how that integrates um, with the system. Uh, and so our goal is to really begin integrating. Um, we've already done that with uh, 863-3, the digital identity guidelines. Again, you'll hear more about that at 11. Um, and some upcoming ones you might have seen, 853 is out for public comment. Um, we did a significant uh, rewrite of, of uh, moving privacy controls from that separate appendix hanging out at the end um, into a complete integration into the controls catalog. Um, and so more, more will be upcoming. Um, and this is just some of our resources. Um, so happy to take questions outside. Thank you, Naomi. Next up, we have Daniel Lewis from the U.S. Census, Census Bureau. Mr. Lewis serves as the U.S. Census Bureau Program Chief Engineer for the 2020 Decennial Program. In his role, Dan provides the program with technical leadership, full systems development lifecycle, system engineering, and enterprise technical management. And Dan also leads and manages a cross-functional systems engineering integration and test team comprised of government and contractor personnel. Prior to joining the Census Bureau, Dan was the lead engineer for the National Geospatial Agency, Intelligent Agency's Enhanced View program, where he managed information assurance design, functional and system security requirements and implementation, configuration, validation, operational sustainment, and reporting and monitoring throughout the software development lifecycle. Dan served in the US Army during Operation Iraqi Freedom and supported the Army's effort to combat the threat posed by improvised explosive devices. For his service, Dan was awarded multiple Army Achievement and Combination Medals. Um, unfortunately, Dan will not be able to um, stay after the session, so I will have his con contact information at the NIST booth. Um, so if anyone has any questions for him, stop by, and I can um, pr provide that for you. Um, Dan? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Kevin said, my name is Dan Lewis, and I'm the Chief Program Engineer for the 2020 Census Program Decennial. 
Uh, I would like to say, start off by saying that on behalf of the leadership in the Office of System Engineering, as well as executive leadership across the U.S. Census Bureau, to include the Decennial Program Managers, our Chief Information Officer, as well as the Decennial Information uh, Technology Division, thank you for extending this invitation. Now to set the stage for the presentation that I'm going to go over, uh, often System Bureau employees, and include myself, are prided in moments like this where we can share information about what we're doing as it relates to uh, the U.S. Census. So the presentation I'm going to go over is going to highlight some of the things that we have done to date as it relates to preparing for the 2020 Census, uh, the things that we are currently doing now in preparation for the 18 end to end Census test, as well as some of our forward-looking uh, progress as we get ready for the actual 2020 Census. Now to further uh, set expectations and to level set, what this presentation will not include is any deep dive in our uh, system of systems solutions architecture, or nor will it include a deep dive into our security architecture. Uh, due to um, many discussions at the Bureau and because of the very, very large uh, OPSEC risk and the uh, target that the U.S. Census would have from a cyber perspective, we at this time elect not to share any of those details in this forum, in this venue, uh, but on a uh, case by case basis, we could, will definitely uh, share with other in, other folks in the industry and in government. Uh, so please do feel free to reach out to me, and we can have those conversations in a, in a more of a private setting. All right. So with that being said, with all the caveats out of the way, let's get into the presentation. So, as with any census presentation, you'll see we have to I have to start off with kind of the background of the census, and so it's often uh, a recapitulation of a few facts you've often learned in history. Everyone knows the U.S. Census occurs once a decade in year zero and occurs on what we call Census Day, which is April 1st. The very first census, of course, occurred in, in 1790, and it is mandated by the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 2. Uh, the first census, of course, covered the population of the first 13 states and the, the territories and districts uh, at that time. But why do we have a census? Of course, it's mandated by the Constitution, but its primary purpose is, to, of course, to count the population and then from that information to arrive at uh, the apportionment counts for, by state for our representatives, uh, for the House of Representatives. A secondary purpose uh, that census data is used for is to help determine the allocation of budget and funding uh, for local and state governments. Uh, on an annual basis, uh, that can be anywhere uh, up to $14 billion, and is used on a variety of programs, uh, as listed uh, on the slide, hospitals, schools, and an array of infrastructure projects. Now, as we conduct a census, we have a, what we call the residence rule that we think is uh, critical in, in the conduct of the census. It's our mandate to ensure we count every single person uh, one time and in the right place where they live. And so in a few subsequent slides, as I talk about the operations of the census, it will become clear how we achieve that goal. Now, from a privacy perspective, uh, any information that we collect uh, for the census is codified in law and protected through what we call Title 13. Uh, Title 13 also provides some guidelines through which or by which we have to uh, manage the census. Uh, in particular, uh, it does not specify what questions would be asked, but it only does specify that the topics for the, would be the subject of the questions would be, have to be provided to Congress three years away from the census day, and the specific questions themselves to be provided two years out. So we're on track to provide those specific questions to Congress on March 31st of 18, county year of 18. Now, in terms of information that's collected, uh, such as PII names, addresses, and telephone numbers, that information shall never be disclosed. And in subsequent slides, I'm going to describe at a high level some of the trade craft and processing that we do to ensure that we achieve that, that objective. Now, from a confidentiality perspective, uh, Title 13 levies very strict penalties uh, if there is a disclosure of, 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 of census information. Every Census Bureau employee, uh, whether they're a permanent employee or a temporary hire that we hired just before the actual enumeration activities for the census, have to undertake a, a special sworn oath 
to ensure for life uh, never to disclose any information that is collected. Uh, if there's any violations of Title 13 uh, and your special sworn oath, penalties could result in up to five years in imprisonment and up to a quarter million dollars in fines. So it's quite hefty. All right, now let's get into some of the details from a programming perspective, program perspective for the U.S. Census. While everyone is aware that Census Day occurs on one day once a decade, and it, it covers collecting data from across the nation, the amount of planning it takes to under, uh, execute a census is phenomenal. This is an illustration of our, uh, what we call the census life cycle in terms of our large phases for research development leading up to uh, the census itself. I'd like to draw your attention to uh, the, the few blue boxes in the, uh, at the top of the timeline to highlight some of the things that we want to do a little bit differently for this census as compared to prior censuses. Uh, we have a goal to try to save the federal government around $5 billion, and in doing so, we want to try to, to the mass practical extent, minimize the amount of temporary uh, hires that we want to hire for the census. Uh, that's an area where we spend a very large amount of funds, and so we want to minimize that effort. Those include personnel supporting the actual enumeration efforts, those folks you know that knocks on your door, and it includes those individuals who perform what we call our listing operation. And again, in a subsequent slide, I'm going to discuss what does that necessarily mean. But as we go through the life cycle, we're asking ourselves a series of questions that we're trying to get answers to to help refine our concept of operations on how we want to conduct a census. So with that being said, we have a, a number of what we call census tests that we undertake throughout the decade. So uh, historic, uh, the last, the most recent census test we had was in 2017, and it centered around our internet self-response instrument. And again, in a, in a subsequent slide, I'm going to talk a little bit more to you about that. All right. So now let's take a look at the census as a whole in terms of the amount of operations it takes to conduct a census. Now, this is a bit of an eye chart, but I'll summarize it by saying that to conduct a census, we bend all the work and activities necessary to conduct a census, to plan it, to execute it, in a series of 35 operations. So if you look at the top of the graphic, uh, the collection of operations that support the program management, design, development, and orchestration of the census are in our support area. To the upper right-hand style still in the yellow area, we have a series of operations that helps to manage our uh, ever-expansive, growing uh, set of field offices that we have to deploy every decade. Uh, every decade, we, we create or have a very large phys physical footprint where we have to create a number of regional offices, uh, census, regional sensor, centers, as well as local census offices. Moving down to the center but left side of the graphic is what we call our frame operations. We have three listed, and I'm going to highlight uh, the one at the bottom of the address canvassing in the next slide. The purpose of the frame operations are to first determine who and where do we have to, uh, to survey, take our census. Once we've determined that, we then can move into what's called our data collection operations. So there are a series of sub-operations in the response data area that govern uh, how we want to collect data, what modes of data collection we want to use, whether we want to use the internet, paper, uh, through a telephony channel, or through, um, through enumerated respondents actually knocking on <clears throat> enumerated doors. Once we've concluded the data collection sets of operations, uh, then we process all of the information and we arrive at a series of products that are then published and disseminated. Uh, and at the bottom, uh, and these are more internal operations that uh, aren't as visible. All throughout the census, we're conducting uh, our testing evaluations. So as data is being collected, we are continuously checking the accuracy and quality of our census responses. We're checking for anomalies, we're checking for uh, fraud, and we're checking for um, just 
different uh, activities that may indicate um, a, a fraudulent response. And lastly, I'd like to draw your attention to what we, what we have called the other censuses. We also conduct censuses in the, what we call the island areas. There'll be in areas such as um, Guam, the Northern Marinari Islands, Puerto Rico, and um, U.S. Virgin Islands. Okay. Here's an example of the 2020 census form that we had in 2010. As you can see, it's a, it's a short form, and we're collecting very basic sets of information. Uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to arrive at the number of personnel counts that we have in a particular household. We're asking simple questions such as your name, gender, age, sex, and, and a few others. We do not ask for uh, a person's social security number. Um, Based upon all data collected, irrespective of the mode of data collection, uh, we perform what's called uh, address verification. And again, in a subsequent slide, I'll provide you a little more information about that. But all information collected uh, at the individual level within a household is sufficiently processed and obfuscated before it's published. So at the end of the day, what that basically means is that for any uh, publicly made publicly available census product that has been uh, created after a census, you as an individual cannot be uniquely identified from those data sets. So we ensure that while you do provide your name, your address, the number of respondents in your households, that information is su sufficiently obscured. All right, so before the start of any census operation, we, we have what's called address canvassing. This is the operation where we have to, prior to the start of the census itself, ensure we know who we need to send out flyers, questionnaires, who needs to respond to the census. Now, while it's at the national level, we know the nature of humans. People move around. Addresses change. Housing units go up and down. So this operation here is geared uh, to occur as closely as possible to the U.S. Census to try to arrive at a fairly stable address list, or what we often, often call at the Census Bureau, the master address file. Now, this is a normal operation that is conducted every decade, but for this particular decade, we wanted to explore a few innovations. We wanted to minimize, again, the amount of people who are actually out walking census blocks, verifying addresses physically, so we've shifted to use of many GIS techniques and remote sensing. Uh, we've partnered with the NGA, my former agency, and are using an ESRI and using a series of, of tools and techniques through change detection to determine, given a certain geographic area, has that area undergone a large amount of change? If that area has, then that would be a possible area that would be candidate for performing on the ground address canvassing to verify. If we are looking at an area where we see it looks pretty stable, there hasn't been a lot of change, a lot of um, urban development, then those areas that we will likely not send out our listers to canvas those blocks. Because more often than not, we'll have good addresses from our historical data. We also, in addition to use of remote sensing and imagery, we also augment all that information uh, with uh, what we call administrative records. So we collect a series of records from other agencies, uh, as well as uh, from commercial records, and we uh, corroborate all, that, all the information together in such a way to determine whether or not a housing unit e exists and if we believe it's occupied. Once we've concluded the address canvassing operation and we think we've arrived at a pretty stable uh, address list, then we begin what's called data collections. So again, for this particular census, unlike the prior ones, we want to uh, innovate a little bit more than we have in the past. We want to use something a little bit revolutionary. We want to have individuals respond to the census to the mass practical extent via the internet. Now I'm sure that everyone is quite familiar with receiving the census forms in the past. You'll sit down with your family, you'll fill it out, and you'll mail it back in. 
Uh, that has been a status quo for, for many decades. Uh, for again, but for this particular census, and you start seeing uh, advertising campaigns and uh, flyers and postcards illustrating this, but we want to, uh, to the fullest extent possible, uh, have the public respond uh, to the census via the internet. Um, we will provide every housing unit that we have in our address list, our master address file, a unique identifier, which will then allow, and instructions, that will then allow your household or someone on behalf of your household to log in and provide the household accounts for everyone residing in that housing unit. Now, given we know that we have a mobile society and not everyone would have the ability to res respond to the census while at home, we've provided another option for still responding via the internet. And that's through what we call the non-ID processing. So individuals will still be able to respond via the internet even if they do not have their census IDs. Uh, the individuals simply need to have knowledge of their physical address. And with that information, we will employ a series of questions to help verify identity, and we will then take the response. Now, all responses that will be collected via a non-ID method, i.e. not using your census ID, will be subject to additional processing scrutiny. And as I mentioned before, uh, we do corroborate all census responses with other sources um, from a big data analytics perspective uh, to ensure that the responses coming in are, are valid. In addition to our new uh, use of the internet for the 2020 census, we're gonna, of course, keep our tried and true method uh, for census responses. So we still will offer the ability for people to respond via the paper route. Uh, so what that basically means that for individuals who have not responded via the internet within a certain window of time, we will send out reminder postcards, reminders, uh, indicators and hints, and if you still haven't received a response at that point, we'll send you out, a, mail out a paper questionnaire, and in hopes that we'll have the questionnaire uh, filled out and returned. Some other lesser known operations that I'll briefly touch upon are what's called group quarters, no response follow-up, federally affiliated account overseas, and the call questionnaire, census questionnaire assistant. So very quickly for what we call group quarters operations, not everyone lives in a home, not everyone lives in an apartment that would have the ability to respond. So these would be the type, this is an operation that would be focused on the types of housing units or residences where uh, individuals uh, may not have the ability to respond for themselves. So this could be in cases where we have individuals living in, in nursing homes or, or shelters. And, uh, in that case, we will reach out to the administrators for those facilities, and they will follow a series of processes to help us to enumerate those individuals in those special housing situations. The next operation is one that I hope will be minimized for this next upcoming census. This is called the non-response follow-up operation. This operation is conducted when we have not received a response uh, from a housing unit, either through the internet or through our paper channel after a certain point in time. If we know that a housing unit exists and we know that it's occupied, again, through the multiple sources that we have, we then will send out one or more enumerators to knock on the doors of those individuals. Again, this is where uh, a lot of costs are incurred by the U.S. Census Bureau, so we're to the mass practical extent, are trying to minimize the use of the non-response follow-up operation. Other two operations that I would like to highlight is what's called federally affiliated account overseas. Uh, this is a very simple operation where if we have American citizens who are uh, doing work overseas or they're deployed, uh, we have relationships with the DOD and the State Department to provide their records. So that's the easiest type of enumeration for us. And lastly, 
we have what's called Census Questionnaire Assistant. Uh, this is basically going to be a set of call centers that would be available for any respondent uh, who elects to, to respond via the internet or paper who have questions about the content of what they're seeing. Uh, so we'll have a series of call centers that we're going to stand up for the 2020 Census uh, that's going to be on call and on hand to answer any questions uh, from the respondents. In certain cases, if individuals are still having trouble uh, submitting their response, we will take the response via our call center staff and, and again, subject those responses to additional processing to just to confirm identity. For all information collected as part of the census operations, they go to uh, our centralized system called the Census Data Lake. Uh, Think of it as, a, again, a big data analytics platform uh, that where we run a series of algorithms and methods to, to determine the accuracy and quality of census responses. And primarily, we're also looking for possible fraudulent responses. If we determine that some of the records received uh, are potentially fraudulent, then for those particular cases, we will then send out enumerators to confirm. Because again, the whole purpose of the census is to count every per everybody once and in the right place. Uh, so we, we are aware that um, there will be individuals who may uh, try to uh, submit botnet attacks or things of nature to skew the results and we are actively employing defenses to prevent that. So a high level slide on security architecture. So this is where I would have liked to go into great detail about how we are designing our internet self-response instrument and how we're using a, a cascading layer of, of defenses to ensure the integrity of the, sense of the, the system itself and to ensure high availability, redundancy, reliability, and so on and so forth. Uh, but at this time, I'll simply say that we are aware of uh, threats, both internal and external to the Bureau. We have employed active safeguards in designing a very secure, scalable uh, uh, system of systems to help us thwart any potential cyber threats. We've also engaged with a lot of partners in, in the other areas of the federal government, in particular DHS, uh, to help us evaluate some of our designs, as well as um, in academia, in particularly Carnegie Mellon. So just a little bit more on our data systems and access controls. So internally to the US Census Bureau, uh, and we have, again, a, a very large collection of systems that comprise our system of systems. But every system uh, that is on our network is associated or tied to our identity access management solution. So we've uh, ensured that no system has its own central management for accounts and role-based access for data. All of that essentially managed through our identity and access management solution. Um, for anyone in the Bureau who elects or needs access to any data that has been collected as part of a census or a survey, we actively track who those individuals are to ensure they have a justifiable need to know and to ensure auditing of, of that information. So we track that through our data management system. And, and lastly below, just gonna mention, uh, we have two high level programs. We call them SETCAP and SETSI, the Census Enterprise Data Collection and Processing uh, Program, as well as the Center for Enterprise Dissemination Service and Consumer Innovation. So in essence, the SETCAP program is a collection of all of our data collection systems that I mentioned before whether or not data is being collected via the internet data channel, via the telephony channel through our, our census questionnaire assistant, or is being processed through a paper form. All right, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, 
do feel free to reach out to me. Um, I would have loved to get into a little more detail that relates to the technical architecture for what's happening at the census. But again, just to recapitulate, uh, we just are not prepared to share too much detail in, the, in this venue. All right, so thank you. Thank you, Dan. Once again, um, if you have any questions for him, stop by the NIST booth. I'll be there, um, and I can provide his contact in information. Craig and Naomi said they're going to hang out here for a little bit. Um, if, if they're not around, um, I can also give you their information as well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brett McDowell. I am on the planning committee for the conference. In just a few minutes, we're going to have today's keynote session. So go ahead and uh, take a minute to find your seats. Uh, this is uh, different from the other keynotes. If you've noticed on the agenda, all the other keynote sessions are you know, from a government agency uh, a leader of one stripe or another. And this is the private sector. This is your one keynote from industry that we try to make sure happens every year. Um, and we're very fortunate to have uh, basically the, the lead of all things identity at Google to join us this morning and share uh, lessons learned and best practices. So I'll just give you a minute to find your seat, and then we'll get started on time. Thank you. do my thing. So welcome again. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce this morning's keynote speaker. Mark Risher is the Director of Product Management at Google for Counter Abuse and Identity Services, protecting users around the world from advanced attacks of all kinds. Uh, and prior to its acquisition uh, by Google in 2014, he was CEO and co-founder of Permium, a SaaS anti-abuse and security provider. And before that, when I first met Mark, he was the spam czar at Yahoo, um, which is something, uh, an opportunity that we had to work on an industry standard that he's going to tell you a little bit more about that all of you should be using uh, to counter uh, email as a threat vector. Mark has regularly presented worldwide to government, uh, industry, and cybersecurity issues. Um, and uh, we are very fortunate to have him this week. Uh, we had to, I think, uh, you know, move the venue away from the hurricane you know, just to get Mark here. Uh, so I'm glad that all worked out. Um, and the, besides defending users at Google from a lot of attacks that you're going to learn more about, uh, you know, Mark does have a fun side of his job. You know, which is making uh, the user experience, as they call it, beautifully personalized. And so today's keynote, um, originally titled Deleting Billions of Passwords, um, is actually going to touch on both how to defend at scale and how to improve the experience at scale. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mark Risher.
Thank you, Brett. In 1986, a device was invented called the club. Many of you are probably familiar with this. It was a deterrent to prevent your car from being stolen. And the logic usually went, people would say, yeah, it's not impermeable, it's not impervious, but at least it makes my car less attractive than the next one down the street, and therefore I'm less likely to get it stolen. And that worked assuming that the attackers, in this case car thieves, are going after targets of chance. That is, they're just walking down the street looking for any old car. But it breaks down when they're looking for targets of choice. If they want your car, it turns out this is not very much of an impediment at all. Because even though it itself was built out of cast hardened steel, thieves found they could cut through the plastic steering wheel with some garden shears and pop it off and then drive away with your car. And so, as Brett said, my name is Mark Risher, and I work on some of these different problems and wanted to share with you a bit of the perspective from Google of when attacks move from opportunism, from targets of chance, to targets of choice. And in so doing, to cover the different ways that we've learned to defend against them, some new approaches and techniques that we've utilized, as well as uh, what I firmly believe that the only chance we have to really move forward is by finding a consistent pattern by deploying and employing similar techniques, similar approaches across all of our different interfaces so that we can improve user experience, so that we can make people safer, and so that we can bite, fight back against these more targeted, more precise attacks. The timer's not running here, in case it should. Um, so with that, the probably obvious to all of you, the attack surface continues to grow, continues to rise, and this is a headline from uh, last fall. The amount of information, the value of the information stored online, and the number of different ways that uh, attackers have found to exploit it continues to rise. So this is a very large challenge. It's something that we all are facing, and it's something that at Google, we look at at even a, a larger scale and with more variation than many have had to deal with. The, the issues around uh, scale at Google have really forced and, and you know, required that we change the way we look at this. Many of the problems we deal with are at such volume that we didn't for a long time notice these targeted attacks. So something like spam, for example, we're used to blocking that at rates of hundreds of thousands of messages per second. And in that kind of context, it's really, really challenging to identify a targeted bespoke attack that's going after one person, that's been specially personalized, that's been specially tailored to that individual. So it's required a real mindset shift and a new way of looking at it. And in fact, the numbers are even larger than that. So we publicly talk about how, again, staying in the email domain with spam, we block more than 99.9% .9 of all messages, uh, all nefarious messages. But the reality is even better and even more stark, which is that uh, even that 0.1% is misleading. We have hundreds of millions of people who receive absolutely zero messages in a given week. And so that spread is not even. Our users come from all over the world, from many different uh, diverse backgrounds, different technical abilities, different infrastructure setups, and it's required this pivot to be able to understand it. Further, within those types of attacks, they are incredibly customized. Uh, we have unique payloads in, in many of the different messages and almost all of these attacks that we care about right now. So gone is the problem of some anonymous, you know, I am a foreign oil minister prince and send me your bank account information, I'll wire transfer $30 million. And now what we're seeing is much more fine-tuned, much more personalized messages. And it may be hard to see here, but each of these is a subtle variation. None of them is actually the same as what Google sends out because we know how to block that and we block these as well. And for the vast majority of them, the payload, that is the URL that the attacker is asking you to click upon, has only been seen one time. That is that the message sent to you, the message sent to you, and the message sent to you have three distinct URLs, distinct variations in the message. It's a very new way of looking at the problem space, and it's required, as I said, retooling and reconsidering how it is that we look at it. One piece that leads this is uh, state-sponsored attacks. 
For more than five years, Google's been warning our users when they receive messages or targeted campaigns that appear to be originating from a state-sponsored actor. And we warn, we've said, more than 6,000 people per month of attacks like this. Not all of these succeed. In fact, very, very few succeed. But it shows that people are out there trying. And what's interesting about these is that state-sponsored attacks are not necessarily the most sophisticated. When you hear state-sponsored, and I'm speaking to government people here, you know, it conjures up these ideas of vast resources and the ability to do cutting-edge work. But instead, what we find is that these are not necessarily sophisticated attacks. They're just very persistent. They're dogged. They continue trying again and again until something gets through. And what comes from that is the uh, evolution of new approaches, new things that don't require expensive resources, don't require massive you know, anti-crypto computing power, uh, but simply require persistence and then spread from there. The commercial equivalent is something known as whaling. So this is when, uh, outside of the sort of politically motivated context, attackers are going after high net worth individuals or executives or people with undue power who have access to sensitive information that can be used for commercial purposes. And here, business email compromise uses those same techniques that we've seen on the state-sponsored side. And of course, these attacks all move down market. They become more and more prevalent, and they become commonplace, and they're out there. So it's really quite a dire and quite a scary world. In fact, we see variations amongst the types of payloads, the types of delivery to different categories. This is some research we presented uh, at RSA a few months ago. But it shows, just to, to highlight, the blue bars are the messages being sent to our commercial customers, people that host their business uh, domains, their business email with Google. And the green is what consumers are receiving. And what you see is that consumers receive a lot more spam. Businesses receive a lot more malware and phishing. But a point that's not even conveyed by this chart is that this varies month over month, suggesting that there's a relatively small number of attackers that are focusing this month on one particular campaign and one particular adversary, and then they switch to another one. So those sorts of patterns show how these techniques that begin at the creme de la creme, at the most sensitive level, work their way down market to where they're fairly commonplace. Fortunately, not everything is dire, not everything is dismal. And in fact, the building blocks are in place for us to work on this. And there are new standards, new capabilities that allow us all together to improve and to make things a better place. So one that uh, we've embraced at Google and have also supported as an industry standard is FIDO Alliance, or the U2F, the universal second factor. And what's unique about this uh, device, this protocol, this approach, is that it is, you know, we don't say in print that it's unfishable, but it is vastly stronger, vastly more robust against the types of attacks that we are seeing because it authenticates directly from your computer to the web browser and to the site that you're trying to visit instead of being something where we rely on humans understanding, interpreting, and correctly typing in things to the correct page. A second standard that we're excited about is uh, work with OpenID and something that we've called RISC, the uh, Risky Incidents Sharing and Coordination Initiative. And this is designed to target the interconnectedness and the sort of weakest link problems that we see, where it is relatively difficult to log into my bank account, but it's relatively easy to get my bank to send a magic link to an unsecured email account that anyone can click on and then gain access to both. And so what RISC aims to do is to bust up those, those feedback loops or provide feedback loops and bust up those attacks by uh, sending real-time signals amongst the different providers. If somebody logs in under somewhat suspicious circumstances and then does a somewhat suspicious action, you may want to convey that back to the original provider. And in so doing, that feedback loop allows us both to get stronger and all of us to work together to prevent it. And then another is uh, DMARC, which has been out for several years. Brett mentioned it in the intro. Uh, DMARC essentially allows uh, res uh, email providers, people, companies, or organizations, or agencies sending email to specify that messages should only come from them. And it gives recipients, receivers, a way to verify if the message was correctly routed or not. 
This is a standard that's been out for quite some time. It is relatively straightforward to deploy. It requires, usually the longest part is simply auditing the various streams of email that your agency sends. And that's something you should do regardless. <laughs> you know, what many people find as they deploy uh, DMARC is, I had no idea we had that other little subsidiary sending a campaign with sensitive information to our customers. So <laughs> being able to audit that is extremely important. I know it takes time, but it's been really valuable. And something else I added here, uh, actually just in the, the speaker room a few minutes ago, is a draft standard we're working on with IETF that is called uh, STS, or Strict Transport Security. And this is an analogous uh, protocol to DMARC that works in the, uh, the transport encryption, or TLS, domain. So for those who are, are or aren't familiar, uh, when sending email between two agencies or corporations or servers, the way that encryption works is opportunistic. The sender says, hey, I'd like to send this encrypted. The receiver says uh, either yes or sorry, I don't support that encryption. And if they say sorry, it falls down to sending in the clear. What STS allows you to do is to publish a policy saying, if you're sending to Google, we absolutely do support encryption. And if you hear anything otherwise on the line, please send us a report about it. There's something suspicious. So please check out this standard. We're hoping to move to uh, last call very soon. In addition to the new standards that are in place, another building block I'm really excited about is second factors being much more commonplace. So with the advent of things like wearables, of uh, internet-connected smartphones, and even ambient devices like here, this is the Google Home, we have more opportunities than ever before to challenge people as they're, uh, as they're logging in. So if we see something suspicious, we have many, many different channels now that we can reach out, and so can all of you. And again, as we get from the sort of gloom and doom to the optimism, I think that if we embrace these in a consistent way, if we embrace them in a way that citizens and users are not surprised and in fact understand and expect these types of behaviors, then we strengthen everything, we improve user behavior, and we get into a much more secure place. Unfortunately, the attackers are not sitting idle. They are continuing to innovate, continuing to iterate. Uh, we have, this is coming from a paper that we'll be uh, presenting at CCS, the Conference on Computer Security, in about two months. It's some original research we did on password dumps and uh, breaches, and we were not able to update it last week based on the Experian, I'm sorry, the Equifax uh, information leak. But what we did is use Google's search crawlers to index and to find all of these password dump files spread around the internet. And all told, we found 3.3 billion unique username and password combinations. And if you think about the number of actual human beings, uh, this is a pretty scary number. From those credentials, we were able to do some analysis. And one thing we found was a minimum of 17% of the passwords were reused between uh, pairs of sites. It was fortunately somewhat lower for the Google side, we were able to protect 66 million users who had their information exposed in one of these breaches, but we found much higher numbers between other pairs of providers. And it's unfortunately difficult for us to tell from this data set the role that time plays in it, but early indications are that even several years after a breach has occurred, people still have not taken steps to change their passwords, they have not taken other remediation steps. So it is a dire situation, there's a lot of, uh, of disappointing information out there. And that, I think, is probably not surprising to many of you, but it motivates us and it motivates you to find ways that we can work better together. Likewise, what we're seeing is increased sophistication from the attackers. And I don't know if I'm the first speaker to present code on the, on the screen here, um, but what you have, you can, you know, if you like, pay attention to the right hand, if not just the left hand side. What you have here is reverse engineering of a phishing kit. So a phishing kit is the, um, essentially the open source infrastructure that a would-be criminal can deploy to try to start grabbing and collecting, uh, you know, information, credentials from users, from citizens, from people out there. And what you see in this breakdown is not sophisticated in the sense that you don't need nation state computing resources, but it is sophisticated in the sense that at the top, it's detecting whether you are 
visiting this page through a proxy, whether you're visiting on a virtual host, and essentially it's doing something we refer to as cloaking, which is trying to ensure that the malicious payload is not revealed to anyone other than the intended recipient, the intended victim. This is a challenge for companies like Google, where we receive messages at the server side, and we'll scan it then, and potentially see just a blank page, and then 12 hours later when a user clicks on the link, he or she would visit the actual malicious site. So that's very challenging. The second block here is something about uh, geolocation. So probably quite common for, for many of you is using the IP address or the network location or the physical location of a user to determine the riskiness. You know, many uh, small businesses are able to say, I only do business in the United States, so if I see traffic coming from outside, it's ipso facto bad and I can, can block it. Uh, Google operates globally. We have a vast diversity of people spread around the world, and so we can't do rules like that. But more importantly, what this line of code shows is that it wouldn't matter. The phishing page collects the IP address and the user agent and all of the necessary data of the victim. So then they can replay it and come very close. We see it's routine that if you click a, um, if you click on the phishing link from, let's say, the Washington DC Convention Center, they know your IP address, and usually if they can find one pretty close by, either a malware-infected machine that somebody sitting next to you might have, or something else in the neighborhood, and by having that information, they know what good looks like, and therefore they can come pretty close to impersonating it. And then the final step there is actually obfuscation within the, the phishing payload themselves. So they encrypt the, the messages that they're sending out so that wherever it ends up can as easily be reversed. I won't go as deep into this, but this is the HTML, the web page side of the same phishing kit. And here again, you see at the top that if you visit the page without cookies or haven't come from the, you know, most uh, realistic preceding page, they'll display different results. They'll display something blank. They'll sort of defang the attack. And the, uh, the true victim is the only person that will see what's really out there. So this type of thing is pretty scary, but unfortunately, it gets worse. We uh, talked for a long time about man-in-the-middle attacks and how man-in-the-middle attacks work even in several of the two-factor authentication scenarios. I'm worried about talking down to you. I'm sure that many of you know this, uh, and for those, I hope you'll apologize or, or you know, give me a moment to walk through, but I wanted to make it more visceral just how easy this is, because for a long time, we hypothesized it was a relatively advanced attack. It was something that required great resources, and I think even for me, a few years ago, my mental image was somebody sitting by the computer, or maybe three shifts of people sitting by the computer, waiting for you to type in your credentials so I could then type them over here, and it, it felt like that would be really hard to do and we'd be able to detect that. Unfortunately, uh, what we see is that it is commonplace, it is easy, and it is built into even open source products that require no skills whatsoever to set up. We even had a product manager set it up just a few days ago. <laughs> Uh, so Evil Gen X was, a, um, uh, was released, I think, back in April, so earlier this year. This was a proof of concept that uses the popular NGINX uh, proxy, reverse proxy, to create a pixel-perfect copy of any login page. And it doesn't stop just at the username and password fields. It continues all the way through to the, um, to the OTP, to the one-time password that's sent by telephone or by other mechanism. We tried really hard over the last two hours to do a live demo here for you, and unfortunately couldn't quite make it work. We even tried a video, and that didn't work, so please bear with me with some screenshots. What I want to do, though, is to show, ah, it's a little too small. So this is, does this look like the Google login page or a phishing page? <laughs> so this is pixel perfect. There is actually nothing whatsoever in the content that is different. Uh, than a Google login page. And unfortunately, a little small on this screen, the URL that's here, it says secure because it has a certificate. It then says HTTPS because it has a certificate. And then it says accounts.google.com.https-com.com. <laughs> and so how many of your users, how many of your citizens, how many of your employees would recognize that 
after the first, you know, let's say 30 characters of information there, there's still something else that says this is totally bogus, totally fake, totally duplicitous. It's pretty scary uh, and also awesome, but also scary. <laughs> Uh, it actually works even better on mobile. This one, we took a screenshot last night. This is uh, from, I believe, an iPhone. And you see here, just because of screen real estate, all it says is HTTPS, accounts.google. Everything else, pixel perfect. And in fact, even that part, pixel perfect. So there's really nothing to see here. So this is, again, it's open source. You can visit that URL, bit.ly.com slash evilginx. You can download it, and you can set it up in five to 10 minutes. And then once it's running, here's what it looks like. <laughs> A user visits this page, enters his or her username. They go to the second step, which is a password in many cases, in Google at least, though this works on many other products, <laughs> other platforms. Um, then Google sends a confirmation text message to the actual legitimate phone. So this here is your actual phone that you expect to receive text messages on, receiving a text message from the actual Google because <laughs> they've just relayed the information through. And then when you type that into the fake site, they type it into the real site. And here is a snapshot of what they're logging on their site. I mentioned before, they're grabbing uh, email and password, obviously. They're grabbing the full user agent. This got truncated, but they're also collecting IP address and other fields that they can use to impersonate and duplicate the attack. <laughs> so quite scary. I'm sorry the demo didn't work, but we actually have it running on a laptop. So if people want to find us later during the conference, we're happy to walk you through it and you know, scare your pants off. Um, fortunately, though, there is hope. We, working together, have, within Google, rather, have made tremendous progress. The attack I just showed actually no longer works. In fact, Christian had to um, get some exemptions in place to make it still work for the demo purposes because we have closed that down and we continue innovating. In fact, 99% of the time, in fact, well over 99% of the time, even if an attacker knows your username, your password, and your phone number, they are blocked. They are unable to log into the system. And that is because of a variety of approaches that we take to do much more than simply check you at the front door and then give you carte blanche access for the remainder of your session. We have uh, been very, very successful, I mentioned before in the pivot to targeted attacks, in segmenting our user population in recognizing that not every user is exactly the same. It sounds obvious, and yet so many systems look at an average user as opposed to realizing the tremendous variation. I mentioned before that we have users around the world. They may have very different levels of technical ability. They may have very different uh, types of equipment. You know, maybe they have just one smartphone. That's their only device. Maybe it's their first device ever. Uh, maybe they have a laptop, a desktop, a tablet, a PC, many different things they can use. That's a key difference. Another key difference for us is even within the United States, those things vary. And so assuming that the average user has a 1.4% likelihood of showing up in a different country tomorrow is meaningless. Instead, what we do is we look at hundreds of millions of people who never travel more than a few miles from their home, and therefore we can lock down really, really tightly. We look at users who only have exactly one computer or one smartphone, and we can lock down really tightly. And anomalies are much louder against those populations than they are against this you know, mythical average user, which when you divide anything by a billion or more, you know, average means nothing. So segmentation has been really, really helpful for us. We've also been able to employ a lot, uh, essentially uh, layers of security that we formalized in the authentication system. So we use strong preventative measures, things like the universal two-factor that I mentioned before, uh, things like the OTP challenge. And please don't take away that you shouldn't put a phone number on your account. It's still vastly better than not, uh, but we use those types of capabilities. We also use a considerable amount of detection. Our second phase is because, as Brett mentioned in the intro, my team is responsible not only for keeping the bad guys out, but also for ensuring the legitimate innocent users get in. If I only had to do one of those, it'd be much easier. <laughs> but because I have that tension, some people invariably will get past the front door who don't belong there. And that's where our second phase of detection kicks in. In detection, we have been working deeply, deeply in machine learning, in behavioral anomaly detection, in heuristics, rules, and patterns, in various ways of identifying suspicious activities after that front door. 
because the front door is really just one factor. We need to continue evaluating, continue reassessing, and that's something that we invest in pretty heavily and we've had great results. And then our third pillar is the inevitable still will happen. Statistically, it's very close to zero, but it does happen. And so mitigation is our third piece. And that is where, I forgot to advance, and that is where we are trying to control the blast radius to limit the amount of damage that an attacker can do. And also, we lump in our proactive measures we do, things like account health, to get people into a more secure, more protected state up front. One of the best ways that we do this is by collecting additional challenge factors. If all we know about you is a username and password, there's very little we can do if that password gets leaked. So we really never rely on a single factor, and our account health and mitigation campaigns are designed to collect additional signals that we can use in the event that something looks dodgy. We'll be rolling out a lot more of this in the coming months, and I encourage you all to, to look and, and learn from or, and, and comment back, give me feedback, because we're certainly not perfect, of further ways we can do it. One of the big changes you'll see that actually starts rolling out on Monday is um, more opinionated advice. In the past, we used to sort of lay out the data for a user and say, here's the places we've seen you log in. You know, you let us know if it looks bad. What we're switching to is much more of an editorial voice, much closer to what you or I would do if a friend asked us to review his or her data. We'll say, for you, that looks a little bit strange. I know you only have one computer. Why do you keep showing up on these other ones? And so that opinionated approach is going to show up more and is, uh, is going to um, hopefully get a lot of people into a much better protected state. So where I wanted to close is the title, this harmonious collaboration, it's trite to say we should work better together. I think everyone knows that. But I do think, I do strongly believe that by following these few steps, we can dramatically improve security. And we don't have to make this typical trade-off between usability and security because we can actually have both. So step one is getting our own houses in order. We have uh, the industry, these houses of cards where there are you know, weak dependencies and weakest links. I mentioned before the one about uh, going to the bank, having it send a link to any old email account, and you know, that really does not raise the bar as much as people think. So cleaning up some of those systems is really important. Uh, in addition, revisiting historical advice. We as an industry have taught users some terrible, terrible things. We've told them that if they use capital letters, lowercase letters, symbols, numbers, punctuation, and it's more than 20 characters, it'll keep them safer. But it doesn't. It has no defense against phishing. If you type in those capital letters, numbers, and symbols into a phishing page, you are just as popped. And it encourages bad behavior. It encourages people to reuse one single password that has that complexity across every site, weakening themselves and the ecosystem at a large. Likewise, things like session times, uh, we have long moved beyond it. In fact, if you log into a web browser on google.com right now, we'll keep you logged in for about two years. So compare that to many government agencies that I deal with in my own life, many small businesses, many large enterprises that kick you out after 15 minutes. What we found through our research is that encourages people to get blind to typing in their password again and again, and they become more susceptible to phishing. And then third step, last but certainly not least, is consistent patterns. When just one of us moves forward and does something different, it feels weird. And in fact, in this highly primed, highly sensitive environment, people are more likely to distrust a pro-security feature. So what we need is for all of us to adopt these things and to move that place forward so that people don't think you're weaker on Google because we're not asking you to log in every 15 minutes and they realize that it's actually better. So that's the way it comes together. And I wanted to close very briefly with this picture. Does anyone know what it is? So this is the kilogram. There is one official kilogram uh, that weighs exactly a kilogram. And it's located deep, deep in a climate-controlled dungeon underneath uh, Paris, France. Unfortunately, when you have a standard that lives in a basement and no one can use it, it doesn't actually work. And so there's a challenge right now that the reference kilograms around the world actually weigh a little bit more, a little bit less. There's an effort underway to change it, to modernize it. NIST people here may know to come up with a new standard so that we all can do it. 
And likewise, for authentication, for identity, and for internet security, I hope that we all can embrace these standards, not leave them locked in a dungeon under Paris, and in so doing, bring consistent patterns to our users so that they're safer and more secure online. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mark. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, as he said, he'll be uh, happy to answer some questions up here. We're officially in break for the next half hour, and we will start back up at 10 o'clock. Thank you. Yeah.